Uh, good, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening again. Welcome to this third day of the Whistle Training on the SDG 241. We are halfway to the end. So in the last two days, we have seen deep the 241 methodology uh, in the, and its first eight sub indicators. Yesterday, we have also seen the agri program and the 50 by 2030 initiative presented by our colleague Flavio. So today we will finish with the remaining uh, three sub indicators of the social dimension. And we will see the two data collection questionnaires related to the 241 and the alternative data source system. Then we will have another colleague presenting how countries report data for the FAUSTAD website. Finally, if we will have time, if not for sure tomorrow, I will present the results of the first comprehensive dispatch. Okay, so before moving to the social dimension, actually yesterday, I, uh, Asandia needs still to show you the Excel on the agrobiodiversity supportive practice, uh, because yesterday we saw the theory and now uh, he will uh, present the, the, the exercise. So I leave immediately the floor to him. So thank you, Stefania, and good morning, everyone. Please just confirm if you can hear me well. Yes. Okay, that's excellent. So immediately we will go to the agro-biodiversity supportive practices, which is the fourth sub-indicator in the environmental dimension. And uh, just to refresh your memories, for this particular sub-indicator, we are proposing two um, set of criteria. One for countries or agriculture holdings within countries that, that is practicing or is in process of getting organic certification. And one for those where organic certification is, uh, is not uh, in, in place as, as of yet. So if you remember, we have six criteria for, for the countries or the agriculture holdings that, uh, that have organic certification and five for those who doesn't have organic uh, certification. Now, let me just show you the working of the, of the agro-biodiversity supportive practices indicator. So like other sub-indicators that we have discussed until so far, both within the economic as well as the environmental dimension, the mechanics and logic and the process of constructing this particular sub-indicator is not different from the others. So what we require for this particular sub-indicator is a set of variables and data items which will then in turn be used to co construct or calculate this particular sub-indicator. One an additional important point that I highlighted yesterday was that for this particular sub-indicator, um, we are not taking into account the agricultural land area of the holding, but instead we focus on the entire area of the holding. Which, is, which, which, which may be different from the agricultural land area. So from this perspective, as you can see here, for this particular um, indicator as a denominator, we are not gonna take the total agriculture area of the holding, but instead we will focus on total area of the holding. And, and there is a reason for that. The, the reason being that one of the criteria is designed whereby we see the extent to which the holding is um, has allocated um, land area to natural vegetation. Okay. And hence, once uh, we take that into account, uh, we we, we must, you know, reflect that in the denominator as well for us to have um, proper estimation of the sub-indicator.
So, um, as I was mentioning, a set of questions are asked, of which the first one is, is this holding, uh, in, in this agriculture holding, are there areas covered by natural or diverse vegetation, include one or a combination of the following, and then, and then basically we pick one of the uh, six options that we have provided provided here. Now again, let me let me reiterate that all these concepts as to what we mean by natural pastures or grassland, wild flower strips, stone and wood heaps, etc., have been explained in in this port document called Enumerator Manual. So again, uh, for, for this particular sub-indicator, as I was mentioning, we are interested in uh, ascertaining because it's built into one of the criteria that we are proposing uh, for this particular sub-indicator. So we are interested in knowing as to what extent of this agriculture holding is covered by natural or diverse vegetation. Um, the ones which are identified in the previous question. So in this question, the, the holder or the farmer will tell us about what type of natural vegetation exists. And in this follow-up question B18, we then ask him as to how much area of the holding is dedicated uh, or covered by, 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 by these vegetations. Now, another criteria um, that we, we, we are proposing um, of course, this was uh, thoroughly discussed, as I, I mentioned, like any other part of SG241. Um, and for this particular uh, criteria, we are asking the holder as to whether he or she are using medically important antimicrobial growth promoters for livestock. So uh, we are certain that, we assess that. And then uh, based on the question, we, we assess as to whether the holding qualifies this criteria or not. Again, another question, did the holding produce cro crops and or livestock that are certified organic or undergoing the certifi organic certification process during the reference period? The answer could very well be yes or no. And then, uh, of course, the information that we have collected within the context of the economic dimension, which is used for land productivity as well as profitability and uh, the uh, resilience um, indicator, we ask as to what was the total value of crops and its byproducts uh, produced by the holding. Of course, the, the idea here is to see as to, um, you know, um, what is the contribution of the different commodities to the farm uh, value of uh, uh, value of output. So this question remained the same from the first part, as you can see here. Then another question is. Um, what is the percentage of agriculture area on which crop rotation or crop pasture rotation involving at least two different crops or pasture of two different plant genuses is practiced? Again, this is the criteria that was proposed to us by the biodiversity experts, both uh, in-house at FAO, as well as um, the countries with whom we were discussing um, the biodiversity sub-indicator methodology in detail. So if you remember, um, a, when I was setting the context for this particular sub-indicator, I mentioned that um, of the 11 sub-indicator, especially the biodiversity one was thoroughly discussed in 2019 with a group of countries, okay, which was led by Canada and included many others, like say, for example, Russia, USA, Argentina, Mexico, um, and, and, and so on. Um, so, so all these, the, each and every wording of the criteria that we are proposing within, uh, uh, for all sub-indicator, but especially the biodiversity one, 
um, is, is thoroughly discussed and deliberated before, before it is finalized. Um, Stefania, um, just one point for us that there are certain rows or uh, cells within, within the Excel sheet which are not getting displayed properly. Like say, for example, this question, right? Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, so, so this, needs to be, this needs to be amended. Then there is uh, another criteria around which a question is developed. That is for each animal species, maximum three that are raised on this agriculture holding, just the different breeds and the different number of animals that they represent, okay? So for each species of animal, we see as to how many of these are, you know, locally adopted breeds. And, and of course, the definition of the locally adopted as to what do we mean by that? Um, we don't have an internationally recognized consistent definition of, uh, of locally adopted, though, you know, it vary from one country to another. So for the time being, the countries can use whatever definition they are using um, for, uh, for locally adopted breeds at the, at the, at the national level. So for each animal species identified, let's say for example, horse, we then ask as to whether it's a local horse, it's a, you know, it's a hybrid horse or, or, or is a mix of both, okay? And then we ask about the total number of animals um, that that particular breed represent. So this is it. So these are all the questions, five or six, of which some are getting repeated from the previous sub-indicator, are required to construct the, the sub-indicator on agrobiodiversity support practices. So as I was mentioning earlier, the criterion one, as per the methodology that uh, we have finalized, is the holding leaves at least 10% of the of its area for natural or diverse vegetation. So we, we see, you know, from the from the very first question that is needed for this particular sub-indicator, we see as to how much area of the holding is dedicated for growing natural and diverse vegetation. So we need information on all the categories, not, not only on the agriculture land area, which, which, which stops here, but as well on farm building and farm yards, forest and other wooded land on the holding, aquaculture on the holding, and other areas not elsewhere classified, okay. And from this question, we estimate, we identify in fact, as to how much area was allocated to natural and diverse vegetation, which is this row. Okay, this row. And we from, from, from the same table above, we know that the total area of the holding is 11. So we estimate then the percentage of area allocated to natural and diverse vegetation. Then as a cross check, as a cross check, we then basically compare the, the information provided in question one with the information provided in question two here. So let me just show you. So information comes from this question then we validate this information with B17 and B18, okay. And from this, we see as to whether the information provided by the holder is, is correct. 
So as you can see here, the first criterion is that the holding leaves at least 10% of the holding area for natural and diverse vegetation. If it is less than 10%, the criteria isn't qualified. If it is greater, if it is equal to or greater than 10%, then the holding is complying with or respecting the first criteria. So in this case, for this particular holding, criterion one is not satisfied. Okay. So, and we move on. So farm produces agriculture products that are organically certified or its product are undergoing the certification, uh, certification process. Okay. We ask the farmer a simple question and based on his declaration, we see as to whether this holding is practicing organic agriculture. So criterion two is satisfied. Criterion three is farm does not use medically important antimicrobial as growth promoters. Now, what do we mean by medically important antimicrobials? Again, this concept has been explained in, in the support documents. So every term and terminology or concept used, uh, which, is, which is new for countries to follow, we try to explain it uh, um, you know, as comprehensively as possible. So this is again a question where we, why we ask farmer as to whether he or she is using antimicrobial as growth promoters for livestock. In this case, the holding or the holder said no. So this criterion is satisfied. Then we see criterion four is at least two of the following contribute to farm production, temporary crops, pastures, permanent crops, livestock or animal products and aquaculture. And then we see from the information that we have collected in the context of, of land productivity, profitability and resilience sub indicators for the economic dimension, we need the same information. So we need the average or latest prices uh, at the farm gate level. We need the physical quantities of those part respective commodities produced by the agricultural holding. We estimate the value of production, which is a mere multiplication of prices with the physical quantities in respective unit of measurements. We estimate the total value of production, which remain the same from the previous uh, sub indicators. If you remember, we were talking about 1477. Then as we are interested in broad categories of different commodities, we club all the crops together, we club all the livestock together. And based on that, we then contribution from trees, if any, contribution from fish and agriculture from any, if any, and contribution from others, if any. And then we see the percentages. Okay. So check if at least two of the above contribute to form production of the holding. In this case, yes. I mean, two of the categories do contribute to farm output value. So this criterion is satisfied. Then criterion number five is practice that the agriculture holding practice crops or crop pasture rotation involving at least two crops or crops or pastures on at least 80% of the farm over a period of three years. Okay. So we ask this question to the farmer. This is a bit complex question. And hence, we have provided ample instructions to the enumerator 
for him to first break down the question into its constituent parts and then in a simple possible way ask this question to the respondent while explaining as to what what is the underlying um, meaning of 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 the of the information which is sought in this question so this question is uh, in other words is broken down into different parts and then ask in a stepwise manner to the respondent and then we see as to as to what response do we do we get if it is greater than 80 percent then the criterion is satisfied if it is less than 80 percent then the criterion is not satisfied as you can see here this holding is not satisfying criteria number five And then criteria number six is livestock includes locally adopted breeds. So first we need to identify the locally adopted. Okay, what do we mean by the locally adopted? So this is a sort of information that we believe the country has access to a priori. Okay, so they have this information and this contextual information need, need, needs to be given to the enumerator. So all the list of breeds of different species of animals as to whether these are local or foreign or hybrid to the country should be provided to the enumerator so that he has he has an idea so well while he's asking the question he can probe further the the respondent in terms of the information that he or she is giving however just to emphasize um, most of the uh, professional uh, livestock um, producers they exactly know as to what type of breed they are raising or rearing on their farm or agriculture holding even even the even the local small scale subsistence agriculture holder if they have livestock operations on their holding even they even they know as to whether the livestock they are raising is locally uh, adopted or local breed or whether it's a hybrid breed or whether it's uh, entirely foreign to to the country or to his region okay now the actual percentage as to how many of the total livestock is locally adopted? Um, we don't care about that. So of the total livestock, even if one is locally adopted, that is that will fulfill the criteria number, criteria number six. Okay. So the actual percentage for us, uh, for this particular criteria doesn't matter. So now that we have covered the six criteria, we, we see as to which holding covered what criteria and, um, and how many. So as you can see here, holding one meets criteria number two, three, four, and six. Okay. So out of six, this holding meets four criteria. Um, likewise, holding two meets only one okay, of the of the six, and we and we proceed this way. So, for green, as I was mentioning yesterday, the agriculture holding should meet at least three of the above criteria, and you know taking into account this logic holding one will be considered as as desirable okay because it's qualifying four out of out of the six and so on so it's a simple logic that we are using so as you can see here holding one is desirable holding two is acceptable holding two is acceptable because the logic that we are proposing for us to qualify it as yellow is that the agriculture holding meets at least one of the above criteria 
and hence it's acceptable and so on. And the last step obviously is the same. We start associating the sustainability statuses, yellow, green, and red with the agriculture land area of the holding. We divide by nationally representative agriculture area to calculate the proportions. So I stop here. Hmm. Okay. So now that we are done with the, with the economic dimension, um, we have finally entered the third dimension, which we call the social, the social aspects covered within the context of SG241 framework. So as I was mentioning earlier, we covered three sub indicators in the environmental dimension, and now we will cover three within the social dimension. So the first one, which is proposed as, uh, as an indicator uh, within the social dimension is wage rate in agriculture. The theme is decent employment, the reference period last calendar year. And as, as I was mentioning in the very beginning, when I was showing you the matrix of the 11 sub indicator, I, uh, if you recall, you know, uh, some sub indicators were not applicable to all kind of or all types of agriculture um, uh, farming systems or agriculture holdings. So for this particular sub indicator, uh, it's not applicable to farms or holdings that employ only family labor, okay? Now, this theme provide information on the remuneration of unskilled employees working on the holding that belongs to the elementary um, occupation group as defined by the International Standard Classification of Occupation, um, ISCO 08. In other words, of course, this, this uh, uh, ISCO or International Standard Classification of Occupation is, um, is developed by uh, International Labor Organization or ILO. In other words, it informs about the economic risks faced by unskilled workers who are performing simple and routine tasks, requiring the use of simple handheld tools and very often considerable physical effort, okay? So here we are focused only on routine um, uh, labor um, uh, or, or unskilled labor who are, who are performing simple tasks. Like say, for example, digging, shoveling, loading, unloading, stacking, racking, pitching, spreading manure or fertilizer, watering, weeding, picking fruits and vegetables, um, feeding animals, cleaning animal quarters and farm grounds, etc. So all, all uh, the simple routine um, uh, task, which doesn't require, which require considerable physical effort, um, but you know, can be performed with simple handheld hand -held tools. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we take into account all those labor classes. Now, the highly mechanized or technical labor is, is not, covered within, within, within this particular sub-indicator. So we see as to what was the average remuneration received uh, or wage rate received by, by these um, um, unskilled workers. Um, and then we benchmark it, it, it against the minimum daily national wage rate or minimum agriculture sector wage rate to see um, and assign sustainability statuses to the agriculture holding. Now, one important point that I would like to highlight is that um, we asked the farmer directly a question as to what was the daily wage rate that he paid to the unskilled labor. Uh, and based on his answer, if this information is directly available, well and good. If, if we don't have this information available, then we have to ask this information indirectly to the to the respondent or to the holder 
and hence us proposing this formula. Okay. So we ask him about the total annual compensation paid to the to the laborers, okay, to the unskilled workers. We then ask him as to how many days or hours these um, uh, unskilled worker, uh, you know, worked on the holding. And we multiply it by A to convert in, into days for us to estimate the daily wage rate paid to the unskilled workers. Now, whatever uh, way the information is provided by the respondent is good enough for us. And you know the only point that we need to make sure is to um, is is the quality of the information provided. So if we are given the daily wage rate paid to the unskilled workers on daily, you know, uh, directly, that is fine. That is very nice. If it is not, then we you know we have to go through this more complicated. Um, um, way of seeking information from the from the respondent um, now what are the criteria or the thresholds proposed for us to classify the agriculture holding and agricultural land area green yellow and red so if the wage rate paid to the unskilled laborer by the given holding is above the minimum national wage rate okay or minimum agriculture sector wage rate whichever is available then we classify this holding as is green. Now, if the holding, as I mentioned to you earlier, it's not applicable to uh, agriculture holding that is um, uh, that is only employing family labor. So, in this respect, um, uh, in this respect, uh, we would classify the agriculture holding by default green. If they are only using, uh, if they are not hiring any any external labor uh, for to perform uh, or help uh, on the on the work on the holding, okay. Uh, the holding will be classified as yellow if the wage rate paid to the unskilled labor is equal to or uh, is equal to the minimum national wage rate or minimum agriculture sector wage rate. And the holding will be classified as red if the wage rate paid to the unskilled labor is below the national minimum wage rate or minimum agriculture sector wage rate. So, based on the based on the criteria um, listed here, uh, we then um, classify the agriculture holding, its agricultural land area. We add up the areas greens, yellows, or reds and we divide by the national representative area for us to estimate these percentages. Now, let me go to the Excel sheet. So as I was saying, like, you know, like all other indicators, we ask, you know, two or three questions for this particular sub indicator as well. Um, now, the first question is, did this agriculture holding hire any worker for carrying out simple and routine tasks? The answer could very really well be yes or no. Okay. Now, of course, again, I'm, I'm repeating myself uh, once more because this is important. So what do we mean by simple and routine task? As I explained to you in the presentation, uh, these have been explained in the enumerator manual to the enumerator. And hence, you know, let me, let me um, underline this, that the training of the enumerator before going to the field in case of administering SG 241 survey is instrumental, it's very important. Okay, so proper training of the enumerator is, is the key to the success of um, administering a CG241 survey and collecting reliable um, um, uh, statistics and data, okay? So the first question is, we, we, we asked the holder as to whether um, they are hiring any worker for carrying out simple and routine tasks. 
And then we asked them as to how much on average the agriculture holding paid in cash or in kind to the worker performing simple and routine tasks. Okay. So daily wage rate in local currency units, both in cash and in kind. Or as I was mentioning, if this information is not available, then it can be formulated in a different way in the form of questions, which are obviously not given here um, for us to estimate the, the wage rate indirectly from the total annual compensation and total annual hours worked. And of course, for the denominator, uh, we are interested in the total agriculture area of the holding, which I've been showing you as part of each sub indicator. So it's nine hectares for, for this particular holding. So the, from the first question, um, we, um, uh, you know, we saw that the holding is hiring employees, external laborers. Yes, the daily wage in local currency is 359. The minimum wage rate in local currency in that particular country or in that particular region of that particular country, if the wage rate is differing from one region to another in the same country, then we should be using that is 265. And then we compare the average daily wage rate with the national minimum wage rate to see as to whether it's equal to above or below that. So in this case, it's above the national minimum wage rate and hence it is desirable. If it is below the national minimum wage rate, then it's unsustainable. And if it is equal to the national minimum wage rate, then it is acceptable. We then associate the sustainability labels or or, or sustainability co cover uh, colors with the nationally, with the agricultural land area of the holding. And then of course the last step remained the same. So we add up the areas green, yellows, and reds. We divide by national representative area to estimate proportions. So I stop here. No questions for now. Let's wait a few seconds. Apparently, this in this case is quite clear. Okay, excellent. So let me just. Hello everyone, welcome back. Let's resume the sessions. Uh, we need to see the last two, two sub indicators of the social dimension. So I leave the floor to Sanjay. So thank you and welcome back everyone. So let me immediately go to the presentation. So the second last sub indicator within the framework of SDG 241 and the, and the second in the social dimension is the food insecurity experience scale or FIAS. As many of you may know, FIAS is already a tier one SDG indicator 2.1.2 for which FAO is custodian agency meaning that it has an established methodology and data on it is regularly collected by countries and reported by FAO. Um, it's customized or tailored version in the context of 241 tries to measure the extent to which the household of the holder or the owner of the agriculture holding are food secure despite having some agriculture 
uh, production. Sorry, food insecure despite having some agriculture production. Now, for the sake of time, uh, I will not go into the details of how to estimate the severity of food insecurity using FIES. First, assuming that many of you may know about this uh, indicator. And secondly, because uh, as I mentioned, due to, uh, the, due to the fact that we are pressed for time. However, I will touch upon the basics of its met methodology while referring you to the training material on SDG 212 that is published by FAO in various UN languages. In short, what is FIES? It is a matrix of severity of food insecurity that is measured at the household or the uh, individual level. It is a statistical measurement scale designed to measure unobservable or latent uh, traits as we call it, and is measured based on people direct yes or no responses to eight questions regarding their access to adequate food given the resources that they have. The fierce questions refer to the experience of individual respondent and as I mentioned earlier, or of a respondent household as a whole. Now these questions focused on self-reported food related behaviors and experiences associated with increasing difficulties in accessing food due to resource constraints, as I, as I just explained. Now, one other important consideration for this particular sub-indicator is that it is only applicable to household farms. So it is not applicable to farms that are managed by big corporates or, uh, you know, which are, which are publicly listed, you know, on, on the stock exchange or owned by um, large companies. So in this case, those um, holdings won't be interviewed based on the eight years questions. We, were, we are only going to administer these questions to the household farms. Now, here are the eight standard fierce questions that are used to collect data on the food insecurity of the, of the household. Um, again, I will refrain from uh, going into the detail of explaining each question. A comprehensive explanation on what this question entails, what is the concept, what is the meaning behind uh, these eight questions is given in the PDF file that is um, attached to uh, this presentation. Um, just to give you an idea, these eight fierce questions, as I already mentioned, ask you know, the information to establish to what extent the household of the holder of agriculture holding is, is food insecure. So let me just cover the first question. So the question is during the last 12 months, was there a time when you or any other member in your household were worried that you would not have food to eat because of lack of money and so on. So the severity of food insecurity that is assessed in these eight questions increases as we go below in, in these eight questions hierarchically. Uh, one other important point is that if um, as part of the interview, if the holder of the agriculture holding or the owner of the agriculture holding is, is not present uh, during the interview. And instead of him, if it is the manager or uh, another relative of the, of the household of the agriculture, uh, of the holder of the agriculture holding, then in this case, we will also skip the eight fierce questions. These, are, these questions are, are not gonna be asked to, the, to any other respondent except for the owner or the holder of the agriculture holding. So keep that in mind. And all these instructions have already been given in the survey module as well as in the numerator manual. So depending on who is answering the questions, these questions may or may not be asked. So once the eight fierce, uh, data on the eight fierce question is collected, the first step is to prepare the data for analysis. So these are the standard 
four steps that needs to be undertaken for, for us to then analyze the data collecting using the eight VS questions. So in, in this first preparation stage of the data for analysis, uh, we add standard labels to the eight questions, okay? Uh, I will explain in the next slide as to what do we mean by that. As a second step, the data is inputted into the model prepared by the FAO FIAS team for parameter estimation. Um, that is the calculation of level of severity of food insecurity associated with each question and each respondent using RUSH model, okay? Now, what is RUSH model? Again, we have published several methodological document. And when I say we, I mean to say the FAO FIAS team, you can familiarize yourself with the model as well as uh, the other uh, integral components as to how we go about analyzing this information. But in, in a nutshell, we estimate two parameters using the RUSH model, of which the first one is uh, the item parameters. These are also technically known as the difficulty parameters. So the terminology that the model is using for uh, when the um, estimates uh, are analyzed um, and produced. Uh, these are the model use the terminology called uh, difficulty parameters for item parameters. Now these refers to and are, are derived directly from the eight VS questions. Okay. The second set of uh, parameters that we estimate uh, are called respondent parameters or ability parameters. These are derived from the number of people who responded to the eight VS questions. Now, once these parameters are estimated, we then um, perform statistical validation where an assessment is made as to whether, depending on the quality of the data collected, the estimated parameters are valid. That is the data are consistent with the theoretical assumptions uh, that informs the model. So you need to make sure that the estimates that are produced by the model, both the item parameters and the respondent parameters qualifies the assumption of the theoretical model that is uh, produced by FAO in collaboration with Cornell University. So once that is done, as a last step, the calculation of sustainability status of the agriculture holding is carried out based on the information analyzed. So um, put, put it differently, once the measure of severity of food insecurity condition experienced by each respondent, that is the holder of the agriculture holding based on their answers to the eight VS questions have, has been derived, the sustainability status of uh, to the holding that is desirable, acceptable, and non-sustainable as per SDG 241 methodology is then assigned accordingly. And I will explain that to you as to how. So the, let's concentrate on the very first step, okay, from the, from the previous slide. Based on the data collected using the eight VS questions, it is prepared for analysis. Um, where each data item is coded two um, is assigned for a no response or zero for a no response. And one uh, is assigned for, for yes response. Depending on the convention you use, you can either use one, two or zero, one, okay? So of course, you know, once the questions are getting asked within the context of a survey, um, usually um, the uh, um, data entry operators uh, or the analyst assigned codes to each questions, right? So in this case, as you can see here, we have assigned the following codes, C underscore C0300 to each questions. Now the second, so, so, so these codes are used and the data is codified. So, you know, instead of yes or no, we, we use uh, one or zero or two or one. And then we add standard labels for the eight fierce questions on which data is collected. Now, these standard labels are those which are used by the FAO model uh, for analysis of the fierce data. So instead of like the, the question codes, we, we, uh, we use worried, 
healthy, few food, skipped, ate less, run out, hungry, and whole day. So instead of the quotes, we, 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 we use the standard labels, okay? Now, once the data have been properly codified with zero or ones, and standard labels are added to the HVS questions instead of the codes, which are used by the data analysts. The next step implies estimating the parameters associated with the HVS question. Now, the methodology underlying the estimation of the parameters for prevalence of severity of food insecurity is based on item response theory, okay? Now, this item response theory, again, is well explained in the in the enumerator manual, as well as as part of the e-learning course of SG 2.1.2. Um, this uh, item response theory or IRT is used to analyze responses to the survey or, or, or test questions. Now, very briefly, the item response theory is a quantitative measure of non-observable constructions, that is latent traits uh, that can be derived from a set of dichotomous or binary variables, as I already mentioned, taking a value one or zero. Thereafter, rush model is applied for the analysis of the FIAS data. And rush model is one of the many um, in the item response theory that is used to analyze um, unobservable or latent traits. So the item parameters as um, uh, you know, or, or the difficulty parameters are estimated using the model or, and arranged by the model from least severe, which is worried to the most severe if, you, if someone goes without food for the entire day. So as you, you, know, you can see here, we, we, we go from the least severe to the most severe condition. Uh, again, let me clarify. So once you input all the information for the eight VS question into the model, these difficulty parameters will be automatically estimated. So you, you, you don't have to um, go through a complex analysis. Uh, you only have to run the, run the model and it will itself estimate all these uh, parameters for you. So thereafter, the respondent parameters are estimated from the raw score. Um, the raw scores are a number of affirmative responses given to the eight VS questions. Um, it is an integer number with value between zero and eight. Uh, and hence, the total number of respondent parameters are in fact nine. So you can have, um, zero for, for all the eight questions, which is, uh, by the way, also a, a response. And then you can have answer one question or two or three. And hence, uh, you know, uh, the reason as to why we will have uh, nine uh, respondent parameters. Now, one and another important point um, to remember is that every respondent who answer yes to the same number of questions irrespective of uh, which one they, they have answered yes to, will be assigned the same raw score, okay? So by this, we mean that the raw score um, is an ordinal, ordinal measure of food insecurity. Um, by that, we mean to say that with someone with a raw score of four or five or six is more food insecure than someone with a raw score of one, two, or three, but we don't know the exact difference in food insecurity severity between these two between these two respondents. So the model will help us estimate the difficulty parameters, which are ordered from uh, based on the extent of severity, and which will also help us estimate the raw scores, the ability parameters, the standard errors, the frequency um, of the. Um, distribution of the people who answered uh, uh, no or yes to a certain question, the expected scores and, and other, other statistics. 
So once the model estimates, once the rush model help us estimate the raw scores, the ability parameters, the difficulty parameters, the standard errors and the frequency, this is all the information that we need. So once we have this information, we input all this information to the, into the Excel sheet uh, that has been prepared by the FAO FIS team, okay, in, in appropriate places. So these appropriate places are well labeled and guidelines around these have already been developed. So once uh, you have estimates from the model, you input all the relevant information in the relevant columns in the Excel sheet prepared by the FEO FES team. An example is uh, uh, given, given, given here. Okay, so we input the difficulty parameters into appropriate places in the Excel sheet. We input the ability parameters, the standard errors and the frequency or the number of cases who answered yes or no to a certain question into the Excel sheet. And once these parameters have been, um, you know, inputted into the Excel sheet, we will get the following output table, which is already part of that Excel sheet as well. So it's a, it's a mere addition of all the data into the Excel sheet once the model process it and the model uh, itself will help us estimate the probability of moderately or severely food insecure associated with each raw score and the probability of severely food insecure associated with each raw score uh, by raw score as you know that these are the number of affirmative responses to the to the eight fierce questions and the model will also help us estimate the prevalence rate uh, of uh, moderate and severe food insecurity and the prevalence of severe food insecurity, which are the values for SCG 2.1.2, okay? Now, as for 2.1.2, which is fierce indicator, this is the final step, okay? So the model will help us these two values and these are the values for the for the indicator itself. Now, in case of 241, as I mentioned to you earlier, we are using a customized or tailored version of the FIES. So we go one step beyond um, uh, the FIES uh, um, uh, uh, process. And this one step beyond is, remember that we, we have to assign the agriculture holdings and by virtue of that, the agriculture land area that the holding manages, owns, or operates sustainability statuses, right? The green, yellow, and red. So all the information that is required for us to indirectly assign um, the uh, status as to whether this holding is green, yellow, or red based on uh, the holder responses to the eight fierce questions have been elaborated here. So the holding will be classified as green or what we call mild food insecurity. If the probability of the household of the holder of the agriculture farm to be moderate to severe food insecure is less than 0.5 and the probability to be severely food insecure is also less than 0.5. Okay, and how do we do that? So we will go here again. So based on the, we will see here the probabilities. Okay, so every question or every raw score has an associated probability um, with it. So depending on how many questions the household of that particular agriculture holding has given a uh, affirmative or yes responses to will be assigned a raw score and we will have that information in the in the database so let's say for example if holding one uh, has uh, given affirmative response to only one question then in this case we will check the probabilities associated with um with with the um with the, uh, with, with, with the data within the table as to what is the associated probability with one affirmative response. And as we can see here, um, both are less than 0.5. Uh, 
okay moderate and severe and as well as severe and hence we will classify that particular agriculture holding as as green if the probability of the household of the holder of the agriculture holding to be moderately and severely food insecure is greater than 0.5 and the probability to be severely food insecure is less than 0.5 then we will classify it as yellow and if the probability of a household of agriculture holding to be severely food insecure is greater than 0.5 then we will assign this agriculture holding and its agricultural land area um, red or unsustainable status now there is one another important uh, point that i would like to highlight um here you know the yellow acceptable is the convention or the terminology that we are using in order to be consistent with within the context of sg241 now this level of food insecurity which we call moderate food insecurity or ex acceptable level of food insecurity is by no means endorsed by fao to be acceptable okay so this is just for the sake of consistency we are using um, you know uh, this terminology so we didn't want to introduce another another term which will then confuse the um confuse the uh, um, both the data analysts as well as uh, the policy makers now as i was mentioning earlier each agriculture holding has a raw score and with each raw score there is a probability uh, estimated the probability to be moderately and severely food insecure and probability to be severely food insecure estimated by the model so we then see as to how many question this holding has uh, replied to what was its raw score and then we associate the probabilities from the model to that agriculture holding and as you can see here the first condition was for the holding to be green the probability of both these um, um, uh, columns uh, to be moderate and severely food insecure and to be severely in food insecure should be less than 0.5 and hence this holding is classified as desirable in this case holding number 4 Uh, we said that the probability to be moderately and severely food insecure if it is greater than 0.5 which is this case but less than 0.5 in case of severely food insecure it will be assigned yellow status and if the probability to be severely food insecure is greater than 0.5 then it will be considered as red or non sustainable so once we associate these uh, uh, statuses to the uh, agriculture holding and agriculture land area that those holdings operate we then add up the areas greens yellows and reds we divide by the nationally representative agriculture area to estimate the proportions so now let me go to the excel sheet so as i was saying you know we ask a set of questions in fact in total eight questions uh to the to the holder of the agriculture holding or the owner of the agriculture holding on behalf of his household and then we collect information based on yes or no responses and those yes or no responses are then inputted into the model to estimate uh, raw scores ability parameters and difficulty parameters which are then transferred into the fao excel sheet that help us calculate the probabilities based on which we then assign the holding um, sustainability status in this so these are the the eight questions the standard eight fs questions okay so i'm not going to go through these remember just one thing that the as we go down um in these questions the the level of severity of food insecurity that we are trying to assess um increases okay so we start with being worried about availability of food 
to be hungry for the entire day. So hungry for an entire or whole day is in fact a more severe food insecurity situation than to be uh, worried about, uh, about uh, having food. So we ask these eight questions and we get responses. One another point that I would like to highlight, I mean, of course, this is captured very well in the e-learning course, is if the person has said yes to the question, um, uh, you know, let's say, for example, if he has uh, said yes to question number C5, then, you know, it's natural for him to say yes to question number C4 as well, okay? So if there are any inconsistencies in the, in the data, which is very well explained in the, in the methodological note, as well as the guidelines and the e-learning material developed for 2.1.2, if there are any consistency in terms of, uh, of data that has been collected, then those uh, instances should be removed from the, from the data set. to make sure that we have consistent and reliable and accurate information collected and analyzed. So depending on the responses to the eight fears questions, as you can see here, so we have uh, four yeses, okay, for, for this particular agric agriculture holding or the holder of the agriculture holding. So he provided four yeses to, uh, of the eight questions. We then add standard labels. So instead of the codes that we are using uh, in the data entry um, you know, phase or stage of, uh, of processing, we then replace it with, with the standard labels that are used by the model. We then codify the yes or no responses into one or zero, one being yes, zero being no. So up until now, it's fa fairly straightforward. There is nothing complicated. We are just, uh, you know, doing some uh, tweaks and adjustment to, to, to the information for, for it to be ready to be inputted into the model. As I mentioned to you earlier, the number of po positive answers or affirmative responses um, is called the raw score for, for, for that particular respondent. In this case, because the respondent gave us four positive answers, four yeses, we assigned it a raw score of four. And we, we do the same exercise for, for other agriculture holdings. Some may have provided six yeses, other two, some three, some one, and so on. So we do this for the entire distribution or the entire you know, sample that we have selected for us to administer our agriculture survey. We input all that information into the model. So, you know, for, for all household. So if there are any weights assigned, uh, you know, we should mention that. Otherwise we will say not available. If there are any um, so these are household weights. In fact, these are individual weights. These are rural and urban weights, if any. These are regional weights, if any. In our case, we are using none. It's not available. So then, as I was mentioning to you, um, we have developed this shiny app the PS app, uh, which is supported by this manual, right? Which provides stepwise guidance on how to use this app and how to analyze uh, the data. So we take this information for all eight questions and using the item response theory where the least parameter obviously is worried, which I was explaining and the most severe is the whole day. If someone goes hungry without food for an entire day. So we input this information to the model and the model help us estimate the difficulty parameters, the standard errors, the infits and the outfits, the standard errors, infit, 
the number of cumulative cases missed or valid. Numbers. And then we calculate the um, difficulty parameters as well as the raw score, the, uh, the, the ability parameters or the respondent parameters and the standard errors. Okay, so the model will help us estimate all these. And then, you know, once the model help us estimate again, the raw scores, the ability parameters, the respondent, uh, the ability parameters, the difficulty parameters, the standard errors, uh, et cetera, we will input this into the template Excel model, again, created by the FAOFES team, which is available here. And we plug in the information at appropriate places. So once we once we do that, the model will help us estimate the probability associated with each raw score. And then based on the raw score uh, on the household or the individual holding raw scores, we then start assigning these probabilities. And then we see as to whether it's greater than 0.5 in both these cases, it's greater than 0.5, but less than 0.5 in case of yellow, or if it is greater than 0.5 in case of severe for us to assign the green, yellow, and red statuses. Okay, so I've already explained this. So the probability of the household of the holder of agriculture holding to be moderate plus severe food insecure is less than 0.5 and the probability to be severely food insecure is also less than 0.5, then the holding will be classified as green. Um, otherwise, um, if the probability is greater than 0.5 uh, for moderately and severely food insecure, but the probability for severely food insecure is less than 0.5, then it's yellow and so on. So once these sustainability statuses or levels are assigned to agriculture holding, based on their probabilities and raw scores. We then associate the same statuses to the agriculture area of the holding, okay? Like, you know, for all other sub-indicators. And then we add up the areas classified as greens, yellows, and reds, and divide by the national representative area to estimate the proportion of agriculture area uh, for this particular sub-indicator by sustainability status. So I stop here. Okay, so, so uh, participants, we, uh, we have now our colleague uh, uh, Nathan, uh, which will present the next presentation, which is a snapshot of the FAUSTAT. So it's the big uh, uh, FAO database. Uh, so Nathan is a statistician in, in the environmental statistics team who has worked also on PROSA. He has worked in the areas of food security statistics and food balance sheets in the division. And he has also worked for two years as a statistician at OECD. So I give the floor to Nitin. Okay, uh, good morning participants. Um, just to do a sound check uh, to verify that you can hear me, Stefania? Yes. Okay, great. So maybe I can just uh, turn my video on to say hello and then I'll, I'll start the presentation. So yeah, my name is Nathan Warner. I'm a, I'm a statistician, as Stefania mentioned, in the environmental statistics team. And I'm happy uh, to be here today to have some time to talk about the reporting processes that we have here at FAO, with also a, a um, focus on our FAUSTAT uh, dissemination platform. 
So I can um, go ahead and uh, share the screen. Can you uh, also verify that you can see the screen, uh, Stefania? Uh, we see our messages, so yeah, go on PowerPoint. Okay, yes. Okay, so I'll be talking about the, the country reporting of um, to, to for statistics here at FAO. Um, also with a focus on the reporting of the countries that are participating in this workshop. So as background, um, we have knowledge generation that are based on food and agricultural statistics, which is a, it's a pillar of FAO activities. And it's expressly mentioned in our article one of our constitution. We have um, internationally known statistical products, which include FAO stats, which I would also like to show you the actual website and dissemination platform uh, after the presentation, just make sure that you can know how to navigate it. Uh, Fish that, which is a platform which has um, statistics on aquaculture and fisheries and Aquastat, which focuses on water use in agriculture and irrigation. So the focal points that we have for our collection processes for our questionnaire-based domains in Faustat, we generally send our questionnaires out to focal points that are from usually national statistical offices, ministries of agriculture and other relevant agencies. Um, some of you are in attendance today and may be familiar with some of the uh, questionnaires that we will focus on later in the presentation. So within this framework, member countries report regularly to FAO in general on an annual basis for national statistics on crop and livestock production, environment, and for example, land use, um, fertilizer use, and pesticides use, as well as social economic issues that are relevant to the themes of 2.4.1. So when we go and look at the actual reporting for the questionnaires, we will also link which of the themes for 2.41, the questionnaires are more are directly linked to. So these data collection processes are well established here at FAO, at the Food and Agriculture Organization. We we send them annually to the focal points. Um, we have a, um, we then process the questionnaires, have contacts with the countries for data discrepancies, do quality assurance, quality control on the data and disseminate the data uh, later in the year. The data dissemination is also in general accompanied by an, an analytical brief uh, for the domain in which global, regional, and country highlights um, are made in the analytical brief. The FAUSTAT domain itself is a free available data platform. It's provided in official UN languages and covers over 245 countries and territories with some differences in coverage uh, among the different domains. Data are available over long time series, often since 1961, for example, for the land use domain. Some of the different domains that are covered are production, trade, food balances, which is in, 
which I'll also go a little bit into more detail when we look at the, the questionnaire. And, but um, the food balances also have an important indicator, which is the dietary energy supply, which is one of the important inputs to the prevalence of undernourishment indicator, which is also part of the SDG uh, re reporting. Um, food security, uh, prices, inputs, population, investment, macro statistics, agro-environmental indicators, emissions. So for the emissions domains in FAUSTAT, we have them um, categorized in terms of agriculture, land use, and forestry. And then um, research and development indicators and emergency response. So the dissemination tools that we have are, we have the, the web page, as well as we have the analytical briefs that I mentioned earlier to accompany the dissemination and uh, working papers, which in general highlight some of the methodological improvements for the different domains, as well as statistical yearbooks in which a big picture of the statistics um, for uh, trends over time are, are highlighted and discussed. So I wanted to highlight the thematic coverage and how it's broken down in terms of some of the teams here in the statistics division at FAO. So as Stefania mentioned, um, we are part of the environmental statistics team for which we have questionnaires for land use, pesticides and fertilizers, as well as disseminating some agro-environmental domains that are not questionnaire based. We have the social and economic statistics team, which is focusing on prices and government expenditure, and the crops, livestock, and food statistics team, which focuses on agricultural production, trade, and food balances. So for the domains that come from environmental statistics, as well as social and economic statistics team and production. We have two joint uh, annual dispatch processes in which the, the questionnaires are dispatched and we collect data from the focal points within the country. On the other hand, for trade, the, the raw data is taken from the uh, UNSD for food and agricultural products, excluding fish. And the food balances are a combination of using the trade and production data with an allocation to different utilizations of the products, including uh, losses and industrial utilization, uh, seed and feed. So this is an example of the cover page for the land use, or this is the crop and livestock production and utilization uh, questionnaire in which you can see the, um, the contact details for the National Reporting Office and contact name. I'll also open up uh, at the end of the um, presentation the, the land use questionnaire just so that you can have an idea idea for those of you who aren't familiar with it, how it is structured and, um, and how it is uh, filled in. So now I'd like to go and focus on the actual reporting for the different questionnaires. So as mentioned, the, the questionnaire is dispatched to focal points within the country, and we have uh, reporting rates 
for the different questionnaires. So here's part of, for example, the, the questionnaire for, for pesticides use and, and the structure in terms of uh, in terms of how it is structured and the way that it is filled in. So for the for the land use questionnaire, so for the countries that are participating um, in this workshop, we would like to thank those countries that have um, already reported uh, to responded to the questionnaire for 2020. We will have another um, dispatch that will be coming up um, in uh, later this year with a deadline, a deadline for um, responding of uh, October of 2021. So Australia, um, we would like to thank Australia, Bhutan, and China as some of the countries that have um, reported not only for 2020, but also for other years uh, for our land use questionnaire, which is linked um, not only to theme five for water and irrigation and theme eight for biodiversity and organic agriculture, but also as you are well aware to the actual de denominator of the 2.41 indicator for agricultural land. Um, other countries that we would like to thank uh, for re reporting to the questionnaire include um, Japan, Malaysia, Maldives, and Mongolia. New Zealand, Palau, who responded in 2018, the Philippines, Republic of Korea, Samoa for 2019, and Thailand, uh, both for 2018 and 2020. So our fertilizers questionnaire, on the other hand, which is linked um, more directly to theme six uh, for fertilizer risk, uh, we have differences in terms of reporting for the fertilizer use questionnaire. Um, some of the countries that in general respond to one of the other questionnaires are can be good responders for all of our questionnaires. We, we realize from our um, perspective and uh, that this can be due to one of, for, for many reasons, um, it could be that we are not actually contacting the right person within the country to provide this data. Um, and what I will point to at the end of the questionnaire is a, is a mechanism in which countries can provide feedback on whether or not we are actually contacting the right person within the country to provide this data. And we also recognize that even at the level of national level statistics, these data can be difficult to, to collect, even at um, the national level for, for some of the um, more disaggregated categories of our questionnaires, uh, countries themselves have trouble um, sometimes in, in um, collecting or um, organizing this data to be able to be sent back to us. For the fertilizers questionnaire, we would like to, to thank those countries that have also reported for, for this questionnaire, including um, Australia for 2018, uh, Bhutan for the, the most recent two years, and China also for the most recent two years, as well as Japan, who has a, a good response rate for all three of the last years highlighting Malaysia and Maldives that have provided data in 2020, Mongolia in uh, 2018, 
uh, New Zealand for 2019 and 2020, as well as the Philippines, the Republic of Korea and Samoa for 2020, as well as Thailand uh, for 2018. So on the other hand, for the pesticides questionnaire, which is uh, most closely linked to theme seven for the 2.41 indicator for, for pesticides uh, risk. Um, we would like to thank those countries that have responded to the pesticides questionnaire, um, including uh, Bhutan for the most recent two years, uh, Japan for 2018 and 19, Malaysia for 2019 and 20, Maldives for 2018 and 20, and Mongolia for 2018, as well as uh, the Philippines for the most recent two years, the Republic of Korea and Samoa for all three of the last reporting years, and Thailand for 2018 and 2020. As part of this uh, separate data collection process that is done with a, uh, a joint dispatch for the, for the production questionnaire, um, which is linked uh, most closely to theme one for uh, productivity and also three, or sorry, uh, yes, theme one for productivity and uh, theme three for resilience. We would like to thank those countries also here that have been reporting to our production questionnaire, which include Australia, um, and to highlight China and Fiji, as well as uh, Japan, Malaysia, and Mongolia. New Zealand, Philippines, Republic of Korea, Singapore, and Thailand that have been reporting um, for 2020 and earlier years. The prices questionnaire, um, which is most closely linked to theme one for productivity and theme three for resilience. Um, we would also like to thank those countries that have reported for um, for this questionnaire. Again, the, the countries that are um, participating in this workshop can see in, in this column the, the institution that are contacted, that is contacted for each of these questionnaires. For example, for Australia, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So for the prices questionnaire, we would like to thank Australia and Rene and Dar Salaam that have reported for all three of the last reporting years, uh, Bhutan for 2018, China, Cook Islands, and Fiji uh, for 2020, and Fiji also for earlier reporting years, as well as Iran, Japan, Malaysia, Maldives, Mongolia, New Zealand, Philippines, Republic of Korea, Singapore and Thailand, with Samoa also providing data in 2019. So to conclude, and before I, um, maybe I can open up also now what I would, a couple of the things that I would like to, to highlight um, before jumping to the conclusions. And then I can um, also uh, uh, do the conclusions. So one thing that I would like to just kind of um, display um, for the participants is in general, the, the way that the questionnaires are structured. So we highlighted the cover page um, in the uh, in the presentation, as well as for the pesticides use questionnaire, um, some of the uh, different data to have for where the data is actually collected. I would like to just um, point to 
more specifically for the land use questionnaire, um, the different data tabs that are used for the data collection. So in general, the questionnaires for environmental statistics are structured with a T minus two, um, so dissemination date minus two years um, with the preceding three years as well, data collection for the columns in which we have the different, uh, in this case, land use items that are broken down um, for data collection. So in addition to agriculture land, which is the important denominator for, for SDG 2.4.1, we do collect um, more disaggregated information on land use, uh, specifically for cropland, for example, with, um, with a further disaggregation in terms of cropland, uh, in terms of arable land, which is land under temporary crops, land under temporary meadows and pastures, and land with temporary fallow, and land under permanent crops. So just as an example for, for cropland, the different sub items that we collect um, for, a, um, for, for the item for cropland for land use. One thing um, that I wanted to highlight for in the questionnaire is this feedback uh, tab in which countries' focal points that are contacted have this space where they can provide feedback in terms of if we are actually contacting um, the right person to collect this information from the country. So this is one of the um, mechanisms that country can, countries can use to, um, to let us know if we are, if we are contacting the, the right person to collect this information, and if not, uh, who that person would be. And this information is quite important to us to be able to, um, to strengthen our data reporting from countries and make sure that we are contacting the right person. The, so now I think I can jump to the conclusions before I can um, also go back and, and just highlight a little bit of how FAUSAT is actually structured. So jump all the way to conclusions. So we think it's important um, as you keep that you keep in mind as you prepare to report on 2.4.1, um, the existing reporting processes that are already well established um, here at FAO to for national level statistics. Um, there's a wealth and a wide range of information that's already available um, on FAUSTAT regarding these existing data processes and expert knowledge on topics that are relevant to 2.4.1. Um, some of these national statistics, which I'm sure um, our Bob and Stefania have gone into more detail in, can be used for uh, initial proxy reporting for countries as they, you know, they, they gear up and they strengthen the, the data reporting for 2.4.1. Um, and we think it's important to leverage on the existing expertise for the reporting processes to FAO, which can serve as an excellent basis um, to strengthen uh, data reporting for, for also for 2.4.1 and also to plan improvements in the future on uh, national surveys and census processes that may be in conjunction with some of the information that you are gearing up to collect for 2.4.1. This information can be, um, can be uh, improved in terms of data collection. 
with the important difference being always that we're collecting data here at, uh, in general, the national level as reports, as opposed to the farm level for, for 2.4.1. So um, what I would like to lastly do is um, open up Faustat so that we can just have a look at how the website and the data dissemination platform is structured. So we have the different uh, relevant themes that are with each of the uh, domains for dissemination um, under each of, of the themes for Faustat. Um, and important, so I, I mentioned some of the different uh, agroenvironmental indicators that are not part of the actual questionnaire-based domains. So the questionnaire-based domains that we highlighted for environment, for example, were fertilizers, uh, pesticides use, and land use. But we have a, a wide range of other agroenvironmental indicators for which we have especially the uh, emissions domains, uh, focusing on emissions that come from agriculture, as well as a newly added uh, soil nutrient budget domain, which focuses on um, either excess or deficiencies in terms of nutrient load for crop production in countries. Um, so that's kind of how the, 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 at the larger level, the, the Faustat dissemination platform is structured. Then more in general, for more information on the specific domain, what you can do is you can click on the actual domain. Uh, we have data available in bulk downloads as well as country, item, element, and year selections. And I'd like to point also to the related documents for the, each of the domains, which have some information on the methodologies, the update history, and the country notes. So for country, if you're interested on specific information for your country, you can also find uh, information in the country, the country notes. Um, so that I think is uh, it for the, for the presentation. One thing that I would like also, and that I will include in the chat will be, um, will be the, a recent uh, document that was uh, uh, published by the, the sixth division, which is the progress towards sustainable agriculture, um, which I will provide a link to in the uh, chat, in which um, we have uh, many national level indicators with themes that uh, overlap um, uh, quite a lot with the themes for 2.4.1, in which we look at trends uh, over time for the specific indicators. And we also present a, uh, a, a, a different um, traffic light approach in which we're focusing on progress over time for, um, for, for different uh, food systems typologies uh, for progress towards sustainable agriculture. So I'll put that in the chat as well as what I'll put in the chat is the, the contact um, that we have for, um, for our questionnaire based domains for environment in which this can be, um, this is one of the emails that we use for countries to provide feedback, um, not only for actually reporting the questionnaires, but also, for example, uh, suggestions for um, focal points uh, for the right person to contact uh, for the questionnaire. 
So I think I can um, hand it back uh, to Stefania. Sure. So just confirm if you can hear me well, because uh, I'm not entirely sure. Yes, yes, I hear you perfectly. Oh, okay, okay. So let me share my presentation with you once again. So colleagues, this is in fact the last sub-indicator within the framework of SG241, the third one in the social dimension. It's, it's named Secure Tenure Rights to Land. Of course, the dimension is social, the theme is land tenure, the coverage is all farm types, and the reference period for this particular sub-indicator is, is last calendar year. So, this sub indicator allows assessing sustainability in terms of rights over the use of agricultural land areas. Um, the reason being agriculture land is a key input for agriculture production. Having secure rights over land ensures that agriculture holdings have control over a key asset and does not risk losing the land in the short to medium term. Um, empirical evidence um, globally shows that farmers tend to be less productive as they are reluctant to invest if they have limited access to and control of economic resources as well as services, particularly agricultural land. Sorry. So how, how do we frame this indicator? It's very straightforward. Again, a set of questions which are, which are asked to the farmer or the holder of the agriculture holding, asking about his uh, security of tenure rights. So we, in fact, ask a total of four questions. Um, this, these four questions have been adopted from another SDG indicator that FAOS custodian agency for 5.8.1, which, um, which is on land rights as well. So those questions are tailored or modified for, and, and um, these questions are asked and based on the data received, we then assign uh, sustainability statuses as per the criteria listed here. So the holdings will be classified as green if it has if if it has access to a formal document with the name of the holder and the holding on it. Or if it doesn't have the formal document, then in this case they the holding or the holder should have the right to sell or bequeath any parcel or plot of the holding. Okay. So the, this is the condition for us to assign green status to the, um, to the holding and its agricultural land area. Um, holdings are classified as yellow. If they have a formal document, okay, an official document, even if the name of the holder or the holding is not on it. And this is usually the case in many developing countries whereby um, the land is you know, named after the ancestors, the grandfathers or the fathers, but it's still considered as a valid document, um, even, even if the name of the direct uh, descendant or the owner is not on, not on that particular document. Uh, the holding will be classified as red. Um, if there is no po positive response to the criteria listed above. If the holding doesn't have a formal document, um, uh, you know, or if he doesn't have the right to sell or bequeath any parcel of the holding, then in this case, the holding will be classified as, as red. So based on the questions, um, based on the data collected through these questions in Bangladesh back in 2018-19, here is the, some, some brief uh, extract of the analysis. So holding one formal document, they said, yes, we do have it. Is your name on it? Yes, we, I have my name on it. Do you have the right to sell or bequeath? Yes, yes. So hence this holding is classified green in terms of secure rights to land. 
holding to they have a formal document but the name of the holder is not on that document even though it's considered as a as a valid piece of evidence that this this person is is the legal um, custodian or um, in charge of that particular piece of land so hence we classify this as acceptable and then non sustainable is the instance whereby you don't have a formal document you don't have the right to sell or bequeath the land um and hence uh, you know this kind of arrangement is is considered as non sustainable from secure tenure rights perspective the last step is the same like for for other sub indicators we add up the areas classified as green yellow and red and uh, again reflect it as a ratio of the total agricultural land area and uh, calculate these proportions so let me go to the excel sheet okay so here are the questions okay that are asked within the agriculture survey module usually these kind of question exist in the census uh, but if these are not there then you know we should make sure that these questions are integrated in either census or the agriculture survey for you to collect information okay. so the first question is about the having a formal document the second question if if the answer is yes then the second question is is the name of the holder or or any member of the holding is listed as an owner or use right holder or use right holder on any of the legally recognized documents so this is the second question the third question is do you have the rights to sell um any parcel of the holding and the fourth question is do you have the rights to bequeath any parcel of the whole day and based on these responses we then analyze the data using the logic given here so holding one has a formal document the name is on it right to sell right to bequeath and so on so this holding is desirable and uh, you know holding two doesn't have a formal document with no name so hence is unsustainable holding three has only access to a formal document uh, the name of the person is not on it so even even that is considered as some kind of secure security of land tenure rights hence it is acceptable and the last step again is the same we assign sustainability statuses to the agricultural land areas we add it up by statuses we divide by nationally representative area to estimate the proportions so with this we came to an end of the framework of sdg 241 which comprises of 11 sub indicators by now you may have sufficient understanding as to what sdg 241 framework is about uh you may have noticed one thing which is that all the information um for all the sub indicators um the methodology is designed in such a way that farm surveys um can be used or agriculture surveys can be used um to collect information on all the all the sub indicators now there is this implicit you know limitation of the indicator that for and i have been discussing those as part of each sub indicator that um for some of these the gold standard uh, data collection vehicle or data collection instrument is is not agriculture survey it it is some other data source like say for example for 
um, land tenure uh, related information census uh, uh, are better equipped for fierce related information uh, though now we have uh, you know uh, refined the methodology to cover um, agriculture household as well but you know household surveys are better suited to collect that type of information for some of the uh, sub indicator within the environmental dimension um, soil sampling and uh, monitoring systems and remote sensing may be, may be better suited to collect that kind of information. But why haven't we considered those? We, we did have, and currently we are considering it. We will discuss it tomorrow as to how uh, we are working on, um, on um, making possible the use of alternative data sources apart from agriculture surveys to report on SCG 241. So that's something that uh, we will discuss in detail tomorrow. So I, I stop here. There is one sheet remaining, which I will, which I will show to you tomorrow um, on the conversion of, uh, of uh, the units and as well as the, the dashboard. The dashboard once, uh, once uh, you know, all the information on the 11 uh, sub indicator is collected how do we derive dashboard and how do we then derive the aggregate SCG 241? So we will we will briefly touch upon that tomorrow before before us entering into the um, data collection and uh, reporting uh, discussions. Oh, perfect! Thank you very much, Aspandiar. Do we have any question on this sub indicator on the last one? Apparently it was clear. Uh, anyway, of course, if you have any question tomorrow, we can take the, again, this uh, sub indicator quickly and answer your question in case you have. I think we have uh, uh, reached the end of this uh, third day, 8.33. So again, another day we finish sharp. So thank you everyone. And uh, we have, as Fandia said, we have finished the framework and uh, tomorrow, we will, uh, we will have other discussions, the questionnaires, uh, alternative data uh, sources, uh, the results of the dispatch. Let's see, we have quite a lot of uh, presentation still to, to give. Uh, we see how uh, the time allows, uh, if we need to skip maybe some or, or not. Anyway, tomorrow will be a very important uh, uh, day for us because we will have an open discussion with you and we will try to to see uh, country experience also from Indonesia. And uh, uh, we, will, we will be happy to, to listen to your concerns, to your plans, how to collect the data and report the SDG 241. So be ready for a deep discussion because we really look forward to it. Thank you again and uh, have a nice day, have a nice rest of your days or your evenings in some countries quite late already. So thank you again and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you, bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye -bye.